Uh, next up, we have a dear friend of mine and to many of us in Southern California, Barry Arbuckle, who's been leading a major hospital system, Memorial Care, into the, the grand new uh, horizon of the future. Uh, Barry's been the chair of the Integrated Healthcare Association, the California Hospital Association, and is heavily involved in hospital-related uh, policy around the country. So uh, we're very excited to have Barry here, and we look forward to your remarks. Thank you, Bob. Let's see. Well, it is true that Memorial Care operates hospitals, and we have for now over a century, uh, but we also have a, a not-for-profit provider-sponsored full-service health plan. We have a physician division that is integrated into the health system with uh, medical group or physicians as well as IPA physicians. We have an innovation fund, and then we have a shared services operation that ties it all together. But I stand before you today as the token hospital guy uh, <laughs> talking about the hospital side of consolidation. And who better to pull from than Bud Fox of Wall Street? This is the first and probably the last time I will quote Charlie Sheen in any presentation. <laughs> that I give, but it seems that this is a time of, of great change in our industry. Uh, in fact, it's probably the most significant change any of us have seen in our careers, and change brings about opportunity, and I believe it's, it's, it's really incumbent upon us all to seize the opportunity that lies before us rather than wait and watch and see what happens next. So these interesting themes are ones that you are familiar with. In this room, I needn't belabor these. Uh, Medicare's uh, movement toward value-based purchasing, uh, the commitment they made that by 2018, more than 50% of Medicare recipients would be in some value-based purchasing uh, plan. Now, it's not lost on any of us that that happens to be in the next president's term, and so therefore then it'll be someone else's problem if it doesn't happen. Uh, but that certainly has set the stage, I think, for all of us. Uh, and it's become a challenge, I think, for many providers, and we're not uh, the only one to be sure, who find themselves in the proverbial position of having a foot in two canoes. And that position of still playing in the fee-for-service game while trying to move or, and play and, and survive in the value-based purchasing game uh, leaves you with three options. Uh, one, which some are pursuing, is maintain status quo for as long as you possibly can. Uh, to quote uh, one hospital CEO in the Southern California market, I understand fee-for-service reimbursement, I do well with fee-for-service reimbursement, and I'm going to ride that horse until she dies. <laughs> That's one option. The second is to treat the two populations differently uh, based upon how you're reimbursed, which I think many are pursuing that option as well, which to me seems fundamentally wrong. But that leaves you with a third option and that is to treat all patients, irrespective of how you're being reimbursed, as if they were under a value-based purchasing or population health style of management. And that is the position that we've taken in our health system, but it's one that I say uh, you can't take lightly because you have to be prepared for some period of time, probably measured in years, of some hits to the year net income. And I appreciate that not all organizations can do that. So the types of consolidation, I, I, I'll speak both of hospital consolidation as well as perhaps the more prevalent uh, hospital physician consolidation and integration in this market. Uh, but it's happening, as we will all well know, across all of these spectrums. The small players or, or medium-sized payers are getting to be larger payers. Hospitals are becoming health systems. Hospitals and physician organizations are coming together. Uh, providers are bringing about their own health plans, as we heard from Sam, that he thinks might be something we see a lot more of in the future. Uh, there's a variety of affiliations and joint ventures, academic partnerships, and then the whole post-acute and ambulatory space is uh, something that we're just beginning to see. And, and I would say that size does matter. And it matters not only for the obvious reasons of purchasing power and negotiating leverage, but also for geographic coverage, uh, clinical capabilities, and population health effectiveness, all the things that I believe are necessary for this period of transformative change. 
So to pause for a few moments on what's going on in the hospital industry, uh, and, and it may be easier to read uh, on the handouts than they are on the screen, uh, but this represents uh, the hospitals, the roughly 5,000 hospitals in the United States. 60% uh, today are in a health system. Uh, which leaves 40% still in some freestanding mode. Uh, we'll clearly see more and more freestanding hospitals joining health systems because I believe they simply cannot survive with very few exceptions being a freestanding hospital for a variety of reasons. But what's happening is not only are hospitals becoming part of health systems, but most recently, and this is just a snapshot in the last 12 months or so, the big are getting bigger the big health systems are joining with other big health systems. And not because either are in financial distress, mostly these are A-rated and AA-rated health systems coming together to create new, very large, regional integrated delivery systems. And that's an important statement in and of itself, but there's also another statement that's being made here that's not represented, and that is, what led to a lot of the health systems today, the creation of health systems today, which was in part a financially stable hospital, picking up a geographically proximal struggling hospital, starting a health system. As they seek to expand, they pick up another financially struggling hospital in some geographic area and bring it in. Those are all but gone. Very few health systems are bringing on those struggling uh, freestanding hospitals into their health system because they're simply not accretive. And while that's a reality, I think it's an unfortunate sign and we may see a lot more impact from that in the coming years. So how is hospital consolidation viewed in the industry? Uh, there are clearly two views of hospital consolidation. Uh, I did have to look long and hard to find one that was wildly favorable uh, about <laughs> hospital cons consolidation, but I did find one from the Center for Healthcare Economics and Policy who did a reasonably good uh, approach of looking back at a number of studies, and they concluded that mergers do in fact lead to more efficient care they increase the value of hospitals in terms of the quality of care and their access to capital, and they enhance patient access. However, the other view, of course, and this is just a, a small piece of it, uh, is that hospital and hospital physician uh, consolidation and integration drives up costs. Our friend Jamie Robinson published this about 18 months ago and concluded that hospital-owned physician organizations were more expensive than uh, physicians who were part of just a, a, a physician-owned organization. And then more recently, in the same uh, magazine or, or journal, JAMA, they concluded that the financial integration between physicians and hospitals led to higher commercial prices and higher spending in uh, outpatient care. So how do those two views reconcile? And I would argue that they're both right. Uh, I would argue that the Affordable Care Act demands consolidation and integration uh, to uh, facilitate achievement of the triple aim. So how do you reconcile the uh, research from Jamie Robinson and a host of others that say these uh, activities are leading to high cost? On one hand, I would say it is entirely understandable and I'm hopeful it'll be short-lived. What I mean by that is this. If you look at uh, hospitals and health systems acquiring physician organizations, obviously the physician organizations that they're acquiring span the gamut. Some are wildly sophisticated with robust and scalable infrastructures. And then some, not so much. Some, as you seek to, as you bring those physician groups into your uh, health system, they don't have an EMR. Uh, their spouse does their billing. It's rather inexpensive, but it's not very good. They can't possibly qualify for a P for P reimbursement. They don't know what a RAF score is. Uh, they're not even remotely qualified to get meaningful use monies. Uh, uh, but they run a low-cost shop. And, and uh, the hospitals have to invest to overcome those. And I suspect the hospitals and health systems are seeking ways to get some return on those investments. Again, I hope that's a relatively short-term exercise and we see it, the market push them back to something more acceptable. But I think another one that was pointed out in that second JAMA article that I cited is a, a trend that is actually much more uh, predominant in our industry. And that is what we're seeing happen as health systems, and I hope I'm not sharing any secrets of hospitals and health systems in this room, but as they acquire physician organizations, physician practices, uh, many times they will move the patients that have historically been cared for quite effectively in community-based, market-priced ambulatory centers into the hospital-licensed outpatient department ambulatory centers. 
Why is that important? Well, the delta in reimbursement with Medicare between a community-based, market-priced ambulatory care center and a hospital outpatient apartment is between 30 and 75% higher. In the commercial space, it's 75 to 350% higher. It's an enormous difference. And if you look at that nationwide, it's happening just in, in, in increasing numbers. Uh, now, I appreciate, uh, for our own purposes, our health system and other health systems, that the outpatient departments are virtual cash cows. Uh, now, how do you stop this from happening, or what will make this change? Well, one of two things, and maybe both will need to occur. One, the market simply pushes back and doesn't allow that kind of movement of business. The other, which might be easier to implement, although by evidence uh, from them right before the holidays, uh, they're not taking very bold steps, and that is the government intervenes and implements site-neutral payments. Now, some of you know this has been talked about for years. I, for one, was flabbergasted that the feds did not implement some level of site-neutral payments when they did the SGR fix. Because, as you know, the feds are always, looking, are always working in a pay-for environment. If it's going to cost us this, we need to find money somewhere else to offset it. They didn't do it this time, which was surprising. But in the most recent uh, BBA, uh, right, again, right before the holidays, they implemented some form of site-neutral payments, although, in my opinion, it was remarkably weak. Now, you wouldn't know that from the industry because the industry is responding violently negatively, uh, threatening litigation. How can they do this? It's a bait and switch. It's inappropriate. Uh, and I appreciate, again, that it's been a revenue source for health systems for years, but it's simply, in my opinion, not the right thing to do. Patients should not have to travel to, from an ambulatory setting, from a community-based setting, into a complicated hospital environment and pay more for the pleasure. It simply doesn't make sense. Now, I know the argument from my colleagues at the AHA, uh, that is the patients who are, whose care is done in a hospital outpatient department need to be there. I'm not a clinician, so I have no earthly idea if they need to be there, but I asked three of our clinicians to look at three different sets of data and let me know what, num what percent of those patients tr whose care or condition needed the additional resources that a hospital setting provides. 15% is the average that they came up with. So 85% of those patients don't really need to be there. And that's driving up. My concern in this, why I fixate on this to some degree, is I'm a big believer in integration, hospital, physician, provider integration coming together. And this practice is really putting some serious questions around that because it's, it's kind of artificially driving up the cost. So enough of that soapbox. I'll move on. So I, I believe that you can, you can have them both. And I come from, I uh, was born and raised in the Show Me State, and so I feel compelled uh, to use an example of what I mean by the fact that we can have integration, consolidation, and bend the cost curve. That is to provide greater value to patients. And I'll use our own health system as an example. This is how we're organized. I won't belabor this. I mentioned this a moment ago. But we have the hospital division, the health plan division. Our physician division is clearly the most rapidly growing, not only on the physician side, but also on the ambulatory side. Uh, an innovation fund to help seed companies that we think can produce value in healthcare. We're an unusual private equity company in that. Liquidation event, interesting, but not what's driving us. We don't need a five or seven year payback. We're interested in helping these companies develop something that can produce value in healthcare. And then that's all tied together with this thing that health systems have in varying degrees, and it is what we call shared services. In our, in our case, every conceivable back office function, every aspect of any infrastructure of any provider site we have, whether it be in the hospitals, the physician division, the ambulatory centers, or the health plan, are all done one way in one place as cost effectively as possible to drive down the cost to all the other provider sites. So a quick snapshot of our health system, if you're unfamiliar with it, and kind of the evolution. Again, very quickly, uh, we start, we have six hospitals, six acute care hospitals in LA and Orange County, all again driven by one shared services operation, all connected with not only the same EMR, but also connected with the same IT systems. So there's no variation among those entities. And as we've begun to expand out into the ambulatory sector across the continuum of care, bringing on uh, physician practices throughout the region, uh, as well as urgent care centers, 
centers and ambulatory care centers, you see a little UCI logo pop up. Uh, we're very proud of our relationship with uh, UCI uh, Medical Center, uh, providing community-based primary care, uh, working with them in that capacity. Uh, uh, image, imaging centers, surgical centers, and then uh, announced just this week uh, a, a, an investment in dialysis centers, both outpatient dialysis and home-based dialysis. So our, our, our effort here was to diversify away from acute care, to expand our health system across the continuum of care, uh, to move into areas that we believe are fundamental for population health management, and to provide more access points for the community. That movement has allowed us to play in all of these spaces of value-based uh, uh, purchasing. Uh, capitation, as many of you have over the years, we certainly started back in the 90s, uh, got slapped around a little bit, uh, but stayed on in senior cap uh, and have begun to expand uh, our portfolio of, of capitated payment. Uh, certainly we play on the value-based purchasing side, on the facility side, as well as on the physician side. Uh, we are uh, participating in the BPCI, the Bundled Payment Initiative. We're in a host of ACOs. Uh, we're, I was looking for some way to characterize what Vividi is. We're one of the founding members of Vividi uh, because it's an ACO on, an, on the back of an HMO, so it's a tailored ACO, so it's a taco. <laughs> And then as I mentioned, we have our provider-sponsored health plan, which is in large part just uh, an arrow in the quiver. How is this going to play? It has, I don't know, 35 or 38,000 lives, but it's right, for right now it's just an experiment. We're just seeing how we can function in that environment and where it might take us uh, from here. So sticking with that theme of the show me state, I could wax on forever about how consolidation and integration can drive value-based care, but I felt compelled to show some numbers. Uh, we've been in, uh, we're in a number of ACO uh, products. Uh, this one happens to be one with Anthem, 32,000 commercial members, uh, and we have now, uh, we're in our, well into our second year, and the first year results were not insignificant. Uh, shared savings of over 3.1 million, and PMPM savings of over $18 uh, dollars, uh, per member per month, and we stayed in the upper decile in our uh, quality measures as laid out by Anthem. We're also playing in the Aetna Whole Health ACO, which uh, endeavors to, and I think it's beginning to demonstrate, that it can drive down the cost to the employers by 8 to 15 percent. Again, these aren't easy spaces to play in, and we don't know exactly what the outcome is going to be. We just feel that we've built this system to play in this space, and so therefore then we need to play in this space. And then there's Vividi. You're familiar with that. Uh, seven. Uh, otherwise competing health systems to some degree uh, to, with varying degrees of integration even among themselves coming together in partnership with a health plan uh, to go out to the markets as a, an integrated delivery system. Uh, and uh, we now have a year under our belt in this regard. Uh, intentionally kept membership low in the first year because we knew we needed to build a lot of systems to begin to knit together these independent but integrated delivery systems in one market. Uh, we knew that we were you know, competing with kind of a, a hallmark of integration, and that is Kaiser, uh, and, and found their members to be remarkably sticky. Uh, we got remarkable reception from the brokers, uh, a lot of interest in, in these nameplates coming together in this new kind of uh, venture. Uh, but quite honestly, they didn't know exactly how it would work, and so as they introduced us to employers, they tended to keep the employers on the smaller side because they weren't about to risk those big employers with something that was as yet untested. But we're now well into our second year uh, and have continued to develop the systems and the infrastructure to see how something like Vividi can play out in the market as an alternative uh, to other uh, products. And here is just a quick snapshot of how we're performing. Again, I, I feel compelled when I say that integration and consolidation among hospitals and hospitals and physicians can lead to greater value. These, these, these are some of the data that all come from third-party sources. Uh, we've seen mortality decrease. Uh, many of you are familiar with the observed versus the expected, so 1.0 is basically you see the mortality rates that you expect to get given your patient population. We're now, uh, after seeing a 27% drop, at 0.72. ER visits, rather than being roughly 40 per 1,000 members, we're at 14.4 per 1,000 members. Uh, in the C CMS measures for uh, overall uh, rating of hospital experience, percent nines and tens were in the upper quartile. 
Uh, and the, the, the statistics continue. Uh, our medical group are, is in the upper decile on the IHA ratings. And so we continue to focus on these and keeping them very uh, transparent uh, in front of our governance, in front of our management, and from our, in, front of our, in front of our physicians as well. So with that, I will uh, end with a quote from Don Berwick in, in what was his original article on the triple aim. Uh, and what he said was needed to accomplish that, and that is an integrator, someone that accepts responsibility for all three components of the triple aim. I would argue that that requires a integrated, consolidated delivery system, and that integrator must be a single organization. It cannot be a market dynamic or a virtual organization uh, that can coordinate the provision of, of healthcare services. And so that's why I am a big believer in integration and consolidation in the industry. Thank you.